about more of the traditional um, development partnerships that we have so far, and then I'll take over to um, share a little bit of some thoughts just from lessons learned so far on how we might build partnerships to be more resilient and transformative. And we're going to, the plan is to have the bulk of the time in discussion, because this is really, I think, an evolving body of work. Um, so I'm Bo. This photo here is from a, a 300 year old thatched roof farmhouse in rural Japan that I lived in for two years. And it was where I got my start in really wanting to better understand how we steward the sacredness of our connection to place and to community in the context of a world where there's so much increasing pressure to um, do this thing called economic development, which often tends to take us away from community in place. Um, and then Kristen. Yeah, and I'm Kristen Ryan. I have spent uh, the last 20 years in the real estate field across all sorts of aspects of real estate, property management and development. and. Um, asset management, and that followed 10 years of a career in human services and nonprofit work. And so a lot of my work in the real estate field has been to work on merging. I really think about um, what I often say is I, I, I love building community and I just happen to use the real estate environment and built form as a way to do that right now. Um, yeah, so I will share a bit about my experience and work in working in development partnerships and across community and what Bo was describing as kind of the more standard, the framework of economic development through kind of the real estate development and how those two have interacted. So um, a huge credit first to Patty Julio for the, these concepts in the slide of really outlining what um, community and developers sort of are getting out of a development partnership. And when I think of a partnership as um, really bringing together two parties to try to make a stronger collective whole, we look at one of the, you know, really thinking that what a community might be seeking is development expertise. Um, and use that sort of collectively as whether that's staffing time, whether that's sort of knowledge in the field, in the development process, financial strength that might support that in order to create uh, and help support that same skill building and capacity and asset building amongst community. And then what I think a developer really is often um, seeking or receiving in a development partnership is what I would call community expertise. And really that communities have the strength of their identity and their response um, and their role in holding, holding true community and how that can be shared with developers as developers often and increasingly now with funders prioritizing BIPOC-led development and more integrated community development looking to you know, partner with folks in community to help um, expand their reach, develop a wider geography, or be able to just support with the expertise that they have and, um, and share that as a service. So when we think about what kinds of development partners or what different roles development partners play, I think of them in kind of three categories. One is money and sort of access to the financial balance sheet or guarantee ability that a sponsor might be able to provide as a financial sponsor. One is in kind of expertise, so managing the development process, understanding how that flow works, and that expertise can um, be in different fields, whether it's around housing or residential development or commercial development office or industrial, different types of uh, the development process runs through, but different people will have different expertise within those different sort of product types. But then um, financing expertise is the third bit. And we talk about it in sort of three categories here to help outline just some different elements of it. When we talk about affordable housing expertise, uh, essentially we're speaking to familiarity with the low income housing tax credit financing process. And in our region, sort of the city, county, state tools and subsidy tools that get paired with that financing mechanism in order to create affordable housing. When we speak about commercial financing, what we are sort of distinguishing when we talk about commercial versus cultural or community space really is sort of 
simplified in a way to talk about commercial financing being uh, opportunities where there's a revenue stream. It's a small business, could be a daycare, but that the revenue stream in that situation is kind of more like a monthly lease payment. Um, it's more stable and um, I don't wanna use the word dependable, but sort of stable, regular in its frequency. And part of that means that there's a set of funders or lenders that look to that regularity or the contracted regularity of something like a lease to help understand and reference um, lending payments related to that. Um, no less important are cultural and community space financing. And so, uh, which in this case we're using to reference really spaces that where the the sort of revenue stream may be more irregular, more um, flexible, more fluid, more variable, because it could be, you know, a museum that relies on both membership fees and gift shop revenue and um, event, you know, exhibit revenue, but the regularity of that can be up and down and flow differently through time and funders may just look at that and underwrite that in a different way. So the really when we're talking about commercial or community cultural space here, it's less, um, less distinct around the actual use because you could have uses that are cultural uses but relate to a more regular revenue stream or you could have what seems like a commercial use that can have a more variable, re variable revenue stream. And so really we're looking at those as kind of the types of financing that are available in those two different pots. Uh, we have started a very preliminary matrix here. This is not meant to be an exhaustive list. Please uh, fill in names, add, you know, share in the chat additional people that and groups that can partner. The goal is for this to be a resource for all and we can continue to update it and the slides will be shared over, you know, over time and then we can continue to keep this as a working document. But it's an effort to just outline possible development partners, both in the nonprofit sector and in the for-profit sector, and to identify whether they do have the expertise or the roles around the fiscal sponsorship um, within the affordable housing, the commercial or cultural uh, and community space financing, as well as some sample partnerships or projects that have been outlined. I'll note we vetted this with a number of the partners, the developer partners themselves, but not everybody. So if you see the blue lines, those were folks we didn't have a chance to hear back from in time. Uh, but so we will continue to flux and fill this out for everybody's use as a resource. And then in order to talk a little bit about how do you go about sort of securing the relationship of the partnership, the traditional tools that we've seen and that we use come in a variety of levels. So um, and these have kind of distinct purposes to them. When I think about the MOU, what's really being outlined is at preliminary points of a partnership to outline the shared values, the shared goals between the partners, and then sort of the fundamental, you know, business premise of who is going to take on what responsibilities in that partnership and who is going to take on what risks in that partnerships. Are some held individually? Are they all held collectively? But what are the operating assumptions between the two parties going into the effort to work through this project? When we think about development services agreements and joint development agreements, they tend to be kind of a next level down once the pieces in the MOU have been outlined and thought about. And I think of them really relating more to kind of the services necessary to manage through the development process. And so what does it take to actually build the building that you're working to build and who is going to do what through that process. So in a development services agreement, it's much often much more of just a fee for services agreement. So somebody who is delivering aspects of development process expertise, managing architects, helping um, manage accounting, helping um, work through the permitting process, helping oversee construction, be paid a fee for those services. In a joint development agreement, it tends, it is a much more collaborative um, uh, or shared process in terms of both parties doing different aspects of those responsibilities through those services in order to get the building built. And the last and the ones in the darker blue at the bottom are really reflecting different forms of ownership and the agreements that are in place to help outline kind of who owns the real property itself and in what manner. 
So owners, you know, property can be held in condominium where the same building has different condominium ownerships and a condominium agreement will uh, oversee that along with the rules and sort of the operating rules of how the two, the two, three, four multitude of owners within that condominium will work together over time. If the property is a co-op, then there's a set of co-op documents that outline that and they include a proprietary lease and the and the corporation documents. And those documents will outline that form of ownership. Frequently with tax credit investors, there are partnership agreements and there's a partnership that owns the real estate asset. And the tax credit investor is a part of the partnership and has certain roles and responsibilities and investment uh, and decision-making power within what's outlined in the partnership. LP stands for limited partner, correct? So those are, you know, these are not by far not the exhaustive list. There are other agreements that can be crafted and created, but it gives you a feel a little bit in the levels of how you start to think about who's doing what in a development partnership and who will own what, how will it be owned. Let me take myself off mute. Um, so this next part here is uh, just some thoughts on how we can build more resilient and transformative partnerships. And I will be referring to the Just Transition Framework. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through each of the pieces here. Um, so for example, um, in the Just Transition Framework, we talk about the worldview going, basically our culture going from consumerism to caring and sacredness. So I'll go through each of these components because they really relate to how we might think about partnerships differently, or maybe maybe more just like an illustration of what it is that we are trying to go toward um, with changing the system of real estate. And um, so, for example, with worldview, oops, on the with worldview, what we have is evaluation of dollars. And and by the way, I'm just these are just suggestions. This is kind of more of a framework for discussion. So um, we have valuing dollars. We want to get to valuing each other. Um, and so some possible changes there is essentially shifting how we um, talk about human capital, cultural capital, um, our stories. On the work spectrum, this is for the just transition. This is going from exploitation to cooperation. So what we have right now, and this is kind of the um, part of what we're talking about today is we're pretty used to using contracts as a way of defining our relationships. Um, and we want, what we're going for is actually accountable relationships and contracts are a way of getting there, but we're really also need to focus, would want to focus as well on a resilient process and relational skills. In terms of governance, um, we have gatekeeping and control. Um, we want generative relationships in the, um, um, I think this is, uh, I forget, this is like ecological and social well being, I think, in the just transition. So, how do we track and incentivize um, access to decision making? Um, in terms of governance, we have a traditional capitalist process and we want a process that builds on community strengths and norms. What we, the just transition here goes to deep democracy. So basically designing together um, and not just having outcomes be determined by who has more power. And in terms of resources, this is extractive, this is regenerative. Um, we're trying to go from the scarcity mindset to a feeling to a sense that there are adequate resources for what it is that we need to do. And maybe what it is that we need here is um, more funding and a way of telling the story in a way that, um, and, and I would also add here, um, ways to be creative with our resources so that we're, um, you know, cycling our resources locally rather than just having them continue to drain out of community. So ultimately we're trying to stop the bad and build the new um, and have outcomes that are aligned with community vision. So that's some of the thinking around um, maybe where it is that we're trying to go and super welcome feedback on that. In terms of with that framework in mind, um, real estate can create sort of a cycle of trauma. And it basically comes down to the fact that um, resources tend to be scarce for the kinds of projects that we're doing. Um, they, uh, um, we have 
because <laughs> of the way the financing system and, uh, and uh, both on the affordable housing side as well as on the private side work, there tends to be um, this additional time urgency and then you plop in power imbalances and the fraying of trust and you basically get um, uh, a reinforcing loop. So um, proposing here what the healing cycle would look like is uh, having a process for hard communications, having time to rest and digest, essentially, the parasympath giving the parasympathetic nervous system some time to kick in. Um, and then with that as well, being able to resource creatively. So um, with that in mind, basically what I'm gonna do here is go through each of these pieces and make some suggestions for how we might, at the beginning of a partnership, really ask us the questions that are necessary to have a resilient process. And I'm not gonna go through all of these in detail, but I will pop the link for this presentation in the chat. So when you all go into breakout groups, you'll have access to these in more detail if you wanna talk about them. Um, but in terms of values and priorities, one of the challenges of a development projects is that it, it really, um, it can cause, it can force us to deal with contradicting values, right? So we can value um, having all the community space and we can value getting a, a project done. And sometimes those two things get in conflict when we are in um, a, a, just a resource and time limited situation. And so how do we, how do we prioritize values? Like having a process for that upfront, how do we, you know, what is our really like our highest priority in all of this? In terms of power, getting to an understanding about um, what resources each partner brings. And that doesn't just necessarily mean financial capital. Um, it can also mean, you know, the community, social uh, and cultural capital. So with those resources, wherever there's a dif differential in resources, how might each party end up misusing those resources, essentially um, um, exacerbating any power imbalance and how, what's the process for surfacing those concerns and evening out power throughout the process. What, and you know, getting personal, you know, how, how can somebody, how, how do I know and how might somebody else know when I'm losing trust in somebody? Because one of the tricky things about losing trust is that we also lose the incentive to tell somebody that we are. So how can we hold the space for each other to communicate a loss in trust early so we can catch the tensions early and often and commit to resolving those tensions early and often. And finally, when there's, there's also the fallback plan, right? What are the deal breakers where, you know, if you push us beyond this edge, I need to leave. And how do we communicate early and often about that? Um, what are the consequences to other partners when there is an exit and how do we plan ahead for those so that those consequences are equitable? Um, the second piece is around resources. So um, with resources, having a plan early on for, um, and this gets back to the, the earlier piece I was talking about in terms of values, right? Like how do we use our values to help us prioritize when, when costs need to be cut? And also what are, not just thinking about cutting costs, but how do we get creative with our resources um, and expand our, our sense of what resources we actually have together? Um, and then really similar questions for each partner as well, because within each partner organization, there might be also competing values, right? Like just because you're with the same organization doesn't mean that the people in it necessarily all agree. So within each partnership, how do you, um, or within um, each partner organization, how do you um, figure out values and, um, and, and come to alignment on the use and um, getting of resources? Um, and how essentially here, when, how do we know when to keep on pushing and when to step back and, and, you know, try to get creative on our own end. And also, um, getting clear up front about how the project defines wealth. And if this is also a, a major part of the system that I think we're trying to shift here is thinking about wealth, not just only in terms of the money and the dollars, but having a more expansive understanding of wealth and a more expansive way of, honor, of honoring the different ways that different partners bring different kinds of wealth to a partnership. Finally, there's time. And um, especially when there's time urgency, there can be a hard time. Um, it, it can be hard to reach consensus. So um, what are things that we can agree to up front to um, to, to, to just sort of plan around that, right? So 
Um, when can other people make decisions without me? When did it, when, what clarity can I provide right now for when they need to bring me along? Um, and ditto here in terms of timeline delays, like just sort of thinking in the past, like in my past experience, when do I rush things when I don't actually need to rush them? When do I take too long when I actually need to go faster, right? Like, like what have been my habits about that? And then what, like, when do I replicate those habits on other people and how, you know, what can help me and what can help me help other people make the right, take the right amount of time with certain decisions. Um, and then conflict resolution also, it going back to the values it is, it, it tends to be something that gets constrained and constricted um, in, a, in a way that makes it really hard, especially when time is urgent. And so what, what is our plan up front for making sure that we're breathing and um, building and breathing room to resolve tensions as they arise? So um, what I would just like to leave you here with is just this notion that what Kristen had shared are all the contracts and agreements that go into a partnership. Um, and that's kind of like the, the concrete products, but it's not just these contracts, right? And the building is also not the only concrete product of all of this. A lot of what we're trying to do here, I believe, is, um, is also building a process. So the process that we come up with together is also part of the outcome. So I think we're ready to move into breakouts. I think right now we'd love to, um, we would prefer to give you more time in breakout um, sessions. And I think I took more time than I was supposed to on my part of the presentation. So um, I would like to maybe open it up for any clarifying questions, just clarifying questions only. And then, um, and then I think Alicia will help facilitate breakouts. Thanks. If we're ready to move, Alyssa um, is going to put us into breakout groups. Um, Alyssa Rodriguez works with Cascadia Consulting, is supporting um, all the lunch and learn and trainings as part of this program. And so um, I believe folks can contact Alyssa if, um, if you have any questions during the breakout session. We'll see you in about 10 to 15 minutes. <laughs> Bo and Kristen, I'll turn it over to you. You're on mute, Bo. Okay. <laughs> um, to let's let's take a sec to try to capture the bulk of what um, folks experience in breakout rooms, and I totally recognize this is lightning a lightning round. So, um, right in the chat box, don't hit enter yet, but just type out a key takeaway from or a key thought that you're with, or just something that you're with right now. Um, and do not hit enter. I'm gonna give everybody a minute. So again, in the chat, you're typing out just a key thought that you're with right now. And you're still not hitting enter. I'll tell you when. Okay, hit enter. And take a minute to just go ahead and read what is showing up here. I'll read out a few, just, just things that as I'm scrolling through, I'm not picking and choosing, but community is a form of wealth too. How do we subsidize equitable development? The process is also the outcome, lack of accountability and false representation, action plan. There may be more power in grassroots campaign than in corporate donations. 
just transition framework is great, but how are truly making space the regenerative piece of it and building community and making space for when harm is caused, preventing conflict among partnerships? What does accountability look like? Cultivating resilient relationships, building capacity for trust. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'm gonna pass the um, pass the mic to Alyssa Rodriguez, who's gonna uh, help us just get a little bit of feedback and your requests, especially your requests and ideas for future lunch and learn um, discussions. So, Alyssa, go ahead and lead the group. Gosh, always on mute. <laughs> so I put in the chat uh, the link to this poll everywhere. So um, you can either go to the link that I put in the chat or you can text King County Co at 603 and then this number 2233. And so um, as you all send in your responses to this first question, they'll start appearing on the screen. And um, it's use a word or phrase to describe what went well that you'd like to see more of. So the more a word is input, the bigger it'll be. So sharing, discussion, uh, actors, experiences, storytelling. And these will still be open. I will just go to the next question, seeing that we have only a couple minutes left. Now it's use a word or phrase to describe what you would change for the next time. time, examples, personal experiences. Case studies, examples, discussion, time. And then the last question is, which topic would you like to see more future Lunch and Learns about? And you can select as many as you would like. And um, the next, the fourth question is just what one that might not be listed here. So if you think about that as well. Yes, and this is just any topics that weren't there. And um, this will, will stay open a little bit afterwards so you can um, submit your responses if you didn't have a chance to yet. Uh, 
I'm going to chime in as you're writing to say thank you so much. It is noon. So um, I want to give Sarah Tran um, a moment just to share uh, what some information about some follow up programs and follow ups uh, to today's presentation. Thank you all. Um, I know that time is short and time is valuable, and I'm so glad that we were able to come together today for the first Lunch and Learn in our series of Lunch and Learns, which will be going throughout this year. Um, we didn't get a chance to say this in the beginning, but this is a collaboration between NDC, EDI, and COO Communities of Opportunity. And so we'll have seven more of these Lunch and Learns throughout the year, as well as an upcoming course on Real Estate 102 and an Asset Management course, um, both of those uh, and these lunch and learns are, are being curated by NDC. And I wanna extend my thanks to Bo and Kristen for um, facilitating this really critical conversation today and to all of you for the experiences and thoughts um, that you shared in our whole group as well as in small group. I know that the poll um, only stayed open for a few minutes. So I wanna put into the um, chat is a survey link. We would love to have more in-depth um, feedback and responses from all of you. So please fill it out if you have a chance. We'll be emailing it out along with the PowerPoint and the recording later as well. Um, and then the second link that I just wanna send out real quick is um, the registration link for the Lunch and Learn in May. So um, we hope that you'll be coming to these again. And you know, as we said, the topics will be determined um, in large part by the feedback that you share um, in terms of how you'd like to spend this time in learning with each other. And so with that, um, thank you so much for participating today. Thank you for sharing your experiences, your truth and your wisdom. And we will look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Such an insightful presentation.